Well, good morning, Walden Church. And if you didn't hear me say this last week, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas break. I hope you had a wonderful new year. We started off this 2023 with a brand new series. Uh, we're kicking it off because it's a new year. It's January, first of the month. And so I felt we should discuss first things first. And so last week we looked at finances and in the weeks to come, we're gonna look at subjects like worship and friendship. So I'm excited about that. And the reason for this, I think is because as we begin a new year, we should begin on the right foot. And today I wanted to start off by talking about our homes and our families. And of course that means we'll talk about marriage a little bit. But first, I wanna to talk to all the people who are single. You know, we've been talking about joy recently through the winter, through December, and I said that church should not be a place that beats you up. You shouldn't come into church and feel bad about yourself. The world already will beat you up. The world already will tell you how you measure up. You shouldn't feel that way when you come to church. And I know that marriage and family gets mentioned a lot in church. And sometimes the message for that, there's an underlying message that might sound like it's not okay to be single. Um, one of my very good friends posted to her Facebook wall this last week, one day you will find someone that chooses you and continues to choose you every day. And that's when you will be thankful everything happened the way it did. She said that, she was super in her feels and that she felt lonely. If you're single and you feel that way today, let me give you some assurances. And the first is the church should never make you feel bad because you're single. If it does, just remind yourself, remind the church that the vast majority of the New Testament was written by a single man. Paul identifies himself as being unmarried in 1 Corinthians 7. He says to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. There are some who believe he was married or some who believe that his wife had died, but in truth, he flat out never says, save this one passage where he says that he is single. So I'm gonna take him at his word and say that he was. The full passage says being single or married is not a sin. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is better for you to continue to live alone as I do. There is nothing wrong with being single. Paul says, if you can do it, it's a gift. It means you can live life and live a non-divided life. It means you won't be divided with your love between your love for God and your love for your spouse. But the reason I think we hear a lot about marriage and a lot about raising children in church is because there's a lot in the Bible about those subjects. Proverbs says, my son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. One of the 10 commandments is honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Even the leading and running a church is compared to running a household and a family. First Timothy says, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So typically when a pastor starts to prepare a sermon, maybe about the family or about marriage, a good place for them to start, a traditional place for them to start, would be Ephesians 5 verses 22 and 25. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In fact, I quote both of those passages when I perform a wedding. But today, I don't wanna start here. And I don't even really wanna cover this section at all because I think it's been done. And I think there's even more gold further up the page before we even get to this part. Now, don't get me wrong. I think verses 22 to 25, they're great. And I think you and your spouse should definitely read them together, discuss them. But if all of this chapter is connected, then I think Paul has some wonderful things to say even before this. Starting at verse 18, he says, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, 
but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I don't know what it is about this passage, but I think last year we read this passage of scriptures at least, what, three or four times? So you'll forgive me for using it again, but I don't think there's anything wrong with going back to this passage, especially if I think there's something more here to teach us. And if this passage is familiar to you, if you remember us reading it before, remember now that Paul is saying this right before he starts talking to us about the roles of husbands and wives. In fact, all of chapter 5 gets titled, Walk in Love in Your Bibles. So obviously, we can conclude there is something here for us in our roles as husbands, wives, men, women, and something in here for us to think about when we think about love. So what does Paul say first? He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So the first thing he says is to fill yourself with the Spirit. And then Paul uses this analogy about getting drunk or drinking alcohol. Why would he do that? <laughs> Why would he compare drinking alcohol to being filled with the Spirit? Is it just a, a wordplay on filling or drinking? Maybe. But I'm going to suggest to you that there's something more than that. You see, Paul knows that there's going to be times in our life when we feel empty or lonely, just like my friend posting on our Facebook wall. And perhaps in these moments, we're going to look for other things to fill us. It doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be a vice or an addiction. It could even be a hobby or a leisure activity. It doesn't matter. You're stressed. You're worried. You're feeling antsy. And so what do you do? You light up a cigarette to, to take the edge off. You have a nightcap. You watch something on TV. You eat something. And you could say, well, what of it? You know, if it helps me, and it doesn't hurt anyone, what does it matter? Well, I'll tell you what it matters. It means when you're anxious, and when you're nervous, when you're stressed, when you're burnt out, when you're lonely, when you're hurt, when you're lost, you turn to something besides God to fill you. That's idolatry. It's idolatry because God wants to be the thing that fills you. God wants to be the thing that fulfills you. God wants you to identify as his. Galatians 3 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You don't belong to anyone else. You don't belong to anything else. So any label that society places on you that's null and void, because you are his. Plus, because you are his, you do not belong to anything, so therefore you are not a slave to anything or anyone. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So if you're looking to things like vices and addictions and hobbies to fill you, to fulfill you, that is slavery. If those vices control my behavior, then they control me. They are my master. And I live under those things. But the Bible says you only have one master. The Bible says you only have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But if we are people who take our fill from the Holy Spirit, that means that when we have those feelings of stress, when we have those feelings of anxiety, we are going to go to God to be filled. Then we get our peace from him. We get our joy from him. We get our counsel from him. He is first. Just like we said last week with our finances, we go to him first. We give him first. First things 
first. What's first? God's first. You see, this is why Paul places this before he starts talking about the roles of husband or the roles of wife. We have to get this resolved first. Paul begins here and says, this is foundational. Before we can talk about how you identify or the role you play in a relationship, the starting point for health and success is this. Do you find fulfillment in him? Do you turn to him first for satisfaction? The Old Testament says the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Paul thinks this is foundational, and so do I, especially in this climate that we are living in today, especially in the conversations that we are having today about the roles of male and female, about right and wrong. What fills you? What satisfies you? How do you identify? Whom do you submit to? God has to be the answer to all those questions. Okay, but what if I'm single? Doesn't matter. In fact, I think this is something you need to resolve before you get into any relationship. Because the danger then is in thinking, I'm broken and a relationship with another person, that will fix me. I'll be happy and I'll be content when I am in a relationship with another person. That's bad. It's bad because then all I do is I I now turn my partner into an idol. If my partner fails me or the relationship fails, then obviously it's their fault. Listen, your partner, your spouse, is not a god. They cannot fill you. They cannot meet your desire. They cannot satisfy you. It is not their job to satisfy you. If you can't find contentment as a single person, neither will you in marriage. Paul says you need to enter into a marriage already being filled by the Spirit. Look to God to satisfy you long before you look to another person. And then the couples that put God first together, put God first together, they will have a healthier marriage. Well, Pastor David, I have heard that the divorce rate among Christians is actually the same as it is in the secular world. I've heard that too. Guess what? It's a lie. It's not true. I've heard that statistic as well. I've, I've even used that statistic in sermons, and we're only finding out in the last few years that that research was flawed. In 2008, Barna did a study, and the, 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 the checkbox, being a Christian, right, it was just a question. And, and in other words, for the study, the people, the participants, they were just asked, are you a Christian? Well, guess what? 63% of the U.S. will check that box. The majority of people, if asked, will say, yes, I'm a Christian. But since that study, That research is now being re-examined because Barna also asked the participants in the study if they were active in church membership and active in church participation. In other words, do you not just say that you're a Christian, but do you actually practice your faith? And once they looked at that research, the facts change staggeringly. What they found was that those who were active in their church, the divorce rate was 27 to 50% lower than that of non-churchgoers. Dr. Brad Wilcox, who's the director of National Marriage Project, says that active conservative Protestants who attend church regularly are actually 35% less likely to divorce than those who have no religious preference. So, good news, right? Good news for Christians who attend church and for Christians who practice their faith. Okay, what about this one? You've probably also heard that 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 
That is also not true. <laughs> it's not true. The more accurate is 39% uh, of marriages. And that number is also declining more and more. So why did we used to say 50%? Did it actually used to be higher? No. That number came from a projection of what researchers thought the divorce rate would be after states passed no-fault marriage laws. In fact, Shanti Feldman in her book, The Good News About Marriage, found that 72% of all married people were still married to their first spouse, and of those marriages, four out of five were happy. So the good news is, the divorce rate is not 50%, it's more like 30 to 39%. And then we find that people who keep God at the center of their home and family stay married at far greater rates and even thrive within those marriages. So I hope that gives you a little hope about marriage. I hope that gives you some hope. I remember when I was at another church in my early years of preaching, I had said that same statistic about divorce rate and a concerned woman came up to me afterwards and she said, is that true? And I said, yes. And she said, I don't believe it. She said, all of my friends are Christian and I don't know any one of them who's been divorced. So why do we believe it? Why, why were we all so quick to believe those statistics when we heard them? Well, to be honest, I think the secular world tries to tear down the Christian faith more and more every year. I, I believe we are at war. We are at war. I see it more and more. Christian beliefs, our doctrine, especially the Bible itself, comes under attack every year more and more. And I also believe there is a, a war on marriage. Every year we seem to be changing the rules or redefining the roles of men and women, or redefining the value that we place on children. Because the Bible has a lot of very black and white things to say about men and women and the roles that we play. Ephesians 3 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Marriage is the first foundation that God sets out, that God creates in the Bible. Ephesians 5 says, Therefore man shall leave father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God made marriage foundational. Marriage is the nucleus of the family. In fact, it is the nucleus of society. The United States Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was adopted in 1948, calls the family based on marriage the natural and fundamental group unit of society, and as such entitled to protection by society and the state. To say that the family is the fundamental group unit of society means that it is the foundation. In fact, you trace any nation or empire throughout history that has fallen and then look at their beliefs about marriage, families, and children. They're correlated, they relate. We need a, we need a renaissance of marriage in our, in our civilization if we are gonna survive. Why? Well, quite simply because God made it. God made it. And there are a lot of good reasons to have hope about it, especially if you put God at the center of it which is especially good news for those of us who believe that attending church and being active in your faith matter. The families who say, we are gonna to go to church every week. The families who say, when the body gathers, we gather. They stay together far longer, those relationships are far stronger, and the data backs it up. But let's go back to our passage. Number two, fill your home with worship. The passage says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Where the Spirit is, in other words, if the Spirit is filling us, then the worship will flow out of us, and vice versa. Where the worship flows, the Spirit is. 
what music is being played at your home. My house gets a lot of classic rock. <laughs> My house gets a lot of Weird Al Yankovic. My dad used to say garbage in, garbage out. Certainly not to mean that classic rock or Weird Al is garbage, but think about our days. What is the input being put into your ears and your children's ears? The media, whether it's radio, Alexa, YouTube, video games, reality TV, cartoons, what is going in? If everyone is in their own room, listening and watching to their own media, what is it? What are the voices that speak to your family? And as you walk around the home, what are you whistling? What are you singing? Is it psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Alexa, play classic rock. Alexa, play what? Hillsong? Bethel music? Contemporary Christian? How would the mood of your family, or even your own mood, how would it change if people in your home began humming what a wonderful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What if? What if those were the songs our families were singing? What if those were the voices that rang through our homes? What if those were the lyrics that our children heard us singing? I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I think you get it. We have one more. Fill your lips with thanksgiving. The scripture says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation for a happy, thriving marriage is exactly the same thing as a happy, thriving life. Gratitude. It's gratitude. Before Paul ever mentions the roles of men and women, he encourages you to be a thankful person. We should be people who give thanks. That's what makes for a great life. That's what makes for a happy heart. That's what makes for a happy environment. Think about the happiest, most successful couple, married couple that you know. Okay? Think about them. Most successful, most happiest married couple you ever knew. Think about them. Okay? Got them in your head? Are they grumbly, complainy people? Probably not. Did you know it's impossible to be angry and grateful at the same time? As the Holy Spirit fills your life, then let gratitude fill your soul. One big reason is gratitude will crush all the selfishness that's in your life. You know, earlier we were talking about addictions and vices, the things we run to when we suffer. Let me tell you something. The reason that you suffer is you are focusing too much on yourself. When we suffer, when we wallow, when we experience self-pity, we say things like, look what I have lost. Look at what I am not getting. Look at what's happening to me. Look at my circumstances. Poor me. Why me? I don't have this. I don't have that. I deserve this. But the reason you suffer is that you focus too much on yourself. And if you want to escape that, you don't want to fall into that shame spiral or that pity party, worship and gratitude are the way out. I'll tell you what to do. Number one, take a fast from complaining. Try it for a week. I know we're at the beginning of the year, we're all going on a diet, right? Well, we're, we're gonna fast from food. I want your life to be even better than that. How about you fast from complaining? See if you can stop. Try it for a week. Don't complain about anything. Think I'm wrong? Tell me something. How is complaining or being negative worked out for you so far? How did it work out for you in 2022? Did it change anything? Did your life get better? Did it fix your marriage? Did it fix work? Did it fix the government? 
Can you stop for just a week? Try it. Try to not complain about anything for a week. And then instead, give thanks in all things. Give thanks in all things. Thessalonians says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And you could say, well, you know what, Pastor David, it's not really, it's not really my personality. I'm not really a bubbly, outgoing, thankful kind of person. Guess what? The commands in the Bible, they are not contingent on your personality. They're not. Look at this. This is the Gratitude Journal. I just found this this week on Amazon, uh, and I ordered it. I ordered it, and I'm going to do it, okay? Right here at the beginning of the year, I'm telling you, right, you can hold me accountable. For the rest of the year, you can ask me if I'm filling out my Gratitude Journal. Let's change this year from complaining to gratitude. I'll do it. You, you do it with me. All last year, we believed all the things that the world said about us, and, and look up where that got us, okay? This year, I want to be thankful, and instead, I want to believe all the great things that God says about me. One of my favorite writers posted this to Facebook this week, and I'll share it with you as we close. He writes, she doesn't care whether or not I reach my career or fitness goals. Ain't it the truth? What will your spouse remember about you? What will your kids remember about you? What legacy are you building with them right now? Nobody will remember if you hit your fitness goals Nobody's gonna remember if you hit your financial goals. What they will remember is how God filled you, the song that was on your heart, and how thankful you were in life. You see, in our fear and in our worry, I think we forget the gospel. We forget it. This is not my reality. This place, this earth, this is not my future. My future is heaven because of grace. And any discontentment I feel, it's the same in marriage as it is anywhere else. Discontentment says that God's provisions are not enough for me. When in reality, he is extravagant with me beyond gracious with me, gives me more than I deserve. I listened to a podcaster list all of his goals for 2023 this, this week, and boy, was it long. I had to finally tell Joanna, turn it off. This guy has too many goals. You're looking ahead. You're looking at 2023, all the things you want to do, all the things you want to accomplish, what you want to you know, do with your job or how much money you want to earn. How about a goal this year to be satisfied? How about a goal this year to be thankful? How about a goal this year to be content? How about a goal this year to be filled with the spirit rather than worldly vices? Because Jesus has set you free and you are his. <laughs> so be content, be thankful, be happy. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to offer up a prayer for the marriages that are listening to this. Those that are holding hands with the one next to them, Lord, we pray for their marriage. Good, bad, rocky, on the brinks, or successful for years and years, Lord. This is the covenant that you established between a husband and a wife. This is the institution that you ordained. And so we ask that you bless marriages, that you bless these couples, that you keep them strong and healthy. Lord, may we all find our fulfillment in you. Before we go to anything, especially before we go to another person, Lord, may we be, learn this year to put aside all of our vices all of our addictions, 
and turn to you to find satisfaction, to leave discontentment and grumbling and complaining aside this year, to turn from that and to find our joy in you so that there is always a song on our hearts, that there is always a song on our lips, that we are praising you all our days, and that we are thankful people, thankful for the bounty, bounty for the grace, bount thankful for the extravagance that you give us each and every day. We are free. We are free to love and free to be because of you. And we thank you for all these good things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, as always, we say, we wanna be the church where you live. We wanna be the church as a verb, right? We wanna be the church where you live. And so we offer a lot of things for our community. We have a men's Bible study on Monday. You're more than welcome to drop by for that. It's in the morning, we have coffee, stop by at 9.30. We just go over some things in the Bible and we share our week. Uh, we also wanna let you know that we have a Stevens ministry. So if there's ever something that you wanna talk about with another person, if there's just a struggle going on in your life, we have a Stevens minister who would love to sit down with you, hold your hand and give you some encouragement. If you're going through loss, we have grief share. We have people that have experienced loss and they know what loss is like and they wanna come alongside you and be there for you as you go through this season of life. We also have youth group for all ages. We have an hour for junior high, an hour for high school, and even an hour for college. It's every Wednesday, so we'd encourage you to check out waldenchurch.com or call us for those, uh, those times and that information. We also have Bible study on Wednesday. We're gonna do a Bible study this Wednesday about the parables of Jesus, and we're also gonna do a Bible study on the Chosen TV series, season one, and that'll be in here at 6 p.m. It's brand new, and we invite you to return for that as well. Please call us. Please call us or email us or just drop by and talk to us if there's anything we can do for you or serve you in any way. We love you. See you next week.